Marx and Satan by Richard Wormbrand. Crossway Books, Westchester, Illinois, a division of Good News Publishers, 1987. Introduction. This work started as a small brochure containing only hints about possible connections between Marxism and the Satanist church. No one had ventured to write about this before, therefore I was cautious, even timid. But in the course of time, more and more evidence has accumulated in my files, evidence I hope will convince you of the spiritual danger part and parcel of communism. Marxism today governs over one third of mankind. If it could be shown that the originators and perpetrators of this movement were indeed behind closed door devil worshippers, consciously exploiting satanic powers, would not such a startling realization require action? If some were to reject my thesis out of hand, it would not surprise me. Science and technology advance at a rapid pace because we are always ready to scrap obsolescent machinery in favor of new conveniences. It is quite a different set of affairs in sociology or religion. Ideas die hard, and a mindset, unlike a computer chip, is not easily altered or replaced. Even fresh evidence may fail to persuade. The doors of some minds have rusty hinges. But I offer credible proofs to support my thesis, and I invite you to carefully consider them. The communists have certainly taken note of this book, which has been translated into Russian, Chinese, Romanian, German, Slovak, and other languages, and has been smuggled into the Iron Curtain countries in great quantities. For instance, the East Berlin journal Deutsch Le Rezetung, under the heading the killer of Marx, denounced my book vehemently, calling it the most broadly based, provocative, and heinous work written against Marx. Can Marx be destroyed so easily? Is this his Achilles' heel? Would Marxism be discredited if men knew about his connection with Satanism? Do enough people care? Marxism is the great fact of modern life. Whatever your opinion of it, whether or not you believe in the existence of Satan, Whatever importance you attach to the cult of Satan practiced in certain circles, I ask you to consider, weigh, and judge the documentation I present here. I trust it will help you orient yourself to the problems with which Marxism confronts every inhabitant of the globe today. Chapter 1. Changed Loyalties. Marx's Christian Writings. Today, one third of the world is Marxist. Marxism in one form or another is embraced by many in capitalist countries too. There are even Christians, and amazingly, clergymen, some in high standing, who are sure that while Jesus may have had the right answers about how to get to heaven, Marx had the right idea about how to help the hungry, destitute, and oppressed here on earth. Marx, it is said, was deeply humane. He was dominated by one idea, how to help the exploited masses. What impoverishes them, he maintained, is capitalism. Once this rotten system is overthrown, after a transitional period of dictatorship of the proletariat, a society will emerge in which everyone will work according to his abilities in factories and farms, belonging to the collective, and will be rewarded according to his needs. There will be no state to rule over the individual, no wars, no revolution, only an everlasting universal brotherhood. In order for the masses to achieve happiness, more is needed than the overthrow of capitalism. Marx writes, quote, The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of man is a requisite for their real happiness. The call to abandon their illusions about their conditions is a call to abandon a condition which requires illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore the criticism of this veil of tears of which religion is the halo. Allegedly, Marx was anti-religious because religion obstructs the fulfillment of the communist ideal, which he considers the only answer to the world's problems. And this is how Marxists explain their position, and sadly there are clergymen who explain it in the same way. Reverend Ostryker of Britain said in a sermon, quote, Communism, whatever its present varied forms of expression, both good and bad, is in origin a movement for the emancipation of man from exploitation by his fellow man. Sociologically, the church was, and largely still is, on the side of the world's exploiters. Karl Marx, whose theories only thinly veil a passion for justice and brotherhood that has its roots in the Hebrew prophets, loathed religion because it was used as an instrument to perpetuate a status quo in which children were slaves and worked to death in order to make others rich here in Britain. 
It was no cheap jibe a hundred years ago to say that religion was the opium of the masses. As members of the body of Christ, we must come in simple penitence, knowing that we owe a deep debt to every communist. Marxism makes an impression on people's thinking because of its success, but success proves nothing, which doctors often succeed too. Success confirms error as well as truth. Conversely, failure can be constructive, opening the way to deeper truth. So an analysis of some of Marx's works should be made without regard to their success. Who was Marx? In his early youth, Karl Marx professed to be and lived as a Christian. His first written work is called The Union of the Faithful with Christ. There we read these beautiful words. Quote, Through love of Christ we turn our hearts at the same time toward our brethren who are inwardly bound to us and for whom he gave himself in sacrifice. Marx knew a way for men to become loving brethren toward each other, Christianity. He continues, quote, Union with Christ could give an inner elevation, comfort in sorrow, calm trust, and a heart susceptible to human love, to everything noble and great, not for the sake of ambition and glory, but only for the sake of Christ. At approximately the same time, Marx writes in his thesis, Considerations of a Young Man on Choosing His Career, quote, Religion itself teaches us that the ideal towards which all strive sacrificed himself for humanity, and who shall dare contradict such claims? If we have chosen the position in which we can accomplish the most for him, then we can never be crushed by burdens because they are only sacrifices made for the sake of all. Marx started out as a Christian believer. When he finished high school, the following was written on his graduation certificate under the heading Religious Knowledge. Quote, his knowledge of the Christian faith and morals is fairly clear and well-grounded. He knows also, to some extent, the history of the Christian church. However, in a thesis written at the same time, he repeated six times the word destroy, which not even one of his colleagues used in the exam. Destroy then became his nickname. It was natural for him to want to destroy because he spoke about mankind as human trash and said, quote, No man visits me, and I like this, because present mankind may, an obscenity, they are a bunch of rascals. End quote. Marx's first anti-God writings. Shortly after Marx received this certificate, something mysterious happened in his life. He became profoundly and passionately anti-religious. A new Marx began to emerge. He writes in a poem, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. So he was convinced that there is one above who rules, but was quarrelling with him. Yet, the one above had done him no wrong. Marx belonged to a relatively well-to-do family. He had not faced hunger in his childhood. He was much better off than many of his fellow students. What produced such a terrible hatred for God? No personal motive is known. Was Karl Marx in this declaration only someone else's mouthpiece? We don't know. At an age when most young men have beautiful dreams of doing good to others and preparing a career for themselves, the young Marx wrote the following lines in his poem, Invocation of One in Despair. Quote, so a god has snatched from me my all, in the curse and rack of destiny. All his words are gone beyond recall. Nothing but revenge is left to me. I shall build my throne high overhead. Cold, tremendous shall its summit be. For its bulwark, superstitious dread. For its martial, blackest agony. Who looks on it with a healthy eye shall turn back deathly pale and dumb, clutched by blind and chill mortality, may his happiness prepare its tomb. Marx dreamt about ruining the world created by God. He said in another poem, quote, Then I will be able to walk triumphantly like a god through the ruins of their kingdom, Every word of mine is fire and action. My breast is equal to that of the Creator. The words, I shall build my throne high overhead, and the confession that from the one sitting on this throne will emanate only dread and agony, remind us of Lucifer's proud boast. Quote, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. From Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. 
Perhaps it was no coincidence that Bakunin, who was for a time one of Marx's most intimate friends, wrote, quote, One has to worship Marx in order to be loved by him. One has to at least fear him in order to be tolerated by him. Marx is extremely proud, up to dirt and madness. The Satanist Church and Ulanem Why did Marx wish such a throne? The answer is found in a little-known drama which he also composed during his student years. It is called Ulanem. To explain this title, a digression is needed. One of the rituals of the Satanist Church is the Black Mass, which Satanist priests recite at midnight. Black candles are put in the candlesticks upside down. The priest is dressed in his ornate robes, but with the lining outside. He says all things prescribed in the prayer book, but reads from the end toward the beginning. The holy names of God, Jesus, and Mary are read inversely. A crucifix is fastened upside down or trampled upon. The body of a naked woman serves as an altar. A consecrated wafer, stolen from a church, is inscribed with the name Satan and is used for a mock communion. During the Black Mass, a Bible is burned. All those present promise to commit the seven deadly sins, as enumerated in Catholic catechisms, and never to do any good. An orgy follows. Devil worship is very old. The Bible had much to say about and against it. For example, the Jews, though entrusted by God with the true religion, sometimes faltered in their faith and sacrificed unto devils, Deuteronomy 32.17. And King Jeroboam of Israel once ordained priests for devils, 2 Chronicles 11.15. So, from time immemorial, men have believed in the existence of the devil. Sin and wickedness are the hallmark of his kingdom, disintegration and destruction its inevitable result, the great concentrations of evil design in times past as well as in modern communism and Nazism would have been impossible without a guiding force, the devil himself. He has been the mastermind, the secret agent, supplying the unifying energy in his grand scheme to control mankind. Characteristically, Ulanem is an inversion of a holy name. It is an anagram of Emmanuel, a biblical name of Jesus which means in Hebrew, God with us. Such inversions of names are considered effective in black magic. We will be able to understand the drama Ulanem only in light of the strange confession that Marx made in a poem called The Player, later downplayed by both himself and his followers. Quote, The hellish vapours rise and fill the brain, till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See this sword? The Prince of Darkness sold it to me. For me he beats the time and gives the signs, ever more boldly I play the dance of death. These lines take on a special significance when we learn that in the rites of higher initiation in the Satanist cult, an enchanted sword, which ensures success, is sold to the candidate. He pays for it by signing a covenant, with blood taken from his wrists, agreeing that his soul will belong to Satan after death. To enable the reader to grasp the horrid intent of these poems, I should mention, though with natural revulsion, that the Satanic Bible, after saying, The crucifix symbolizes pallid incompetence hanging on a tree, calls Satan the ineffable Prince of Darkness who rules the earth. As opposed to the lasting foulness of Bethlehem, or the cursed Nazarene, the impotent king, fugitive and mute god, vile and abhorred pretender to the majesty of Satan, the devil is called the God of Light, with angels cowering and trembling with fear and prostrating themselves before him, and sending Christian minions staggering to their doom. Now I quote from the drama Ulanem itself. And they are also Ulanem, Ulanem. The name rings forth like death rings forth until it dies away in a wretched crawl. Stop, I've got it now. It rises from my soul, as clear as air, as strong as my bones. Yes, I have power within my youthful arms to clench and crush you with tempestuous force. While for us both the abyss yawns in darkness, you will sink down and I shall follow laughing, whispering in your ears, descend, come with me, friend. The Bible, which Marx had studied in his high school years and which he knew quite well in his mature years, says that the devil will be bound by an angel and cast into the bottomless pit, abyssos in Greek, see Revelation chapter 20 verse 3. 
Mark's desire is to draw the whole of mankind into this pit reserved for the devil and his angels. Who speaks through Marx in this drama? Is it reasonable to expect a young student to entertain as his life's dream the vision of mankind entering into the abyss of darkness? Outer darkness is a biblical expression for hell, and of himself laughing as he follows those he led to unbelief. Nowhere in the world is this ideal cultivated except in the initiation rites of the Satanist church at its highest degrees. When, in the drama, the time comes for Ulanem's death, his words are, quote, Ruined, ruined, my time has clean run out, the clock has stopped, the pygmy house has crumbled, soon I shall embrace eternity to my breast, and soon I shall howl gigantic curses on mankind. Marx had loved the words of Mephistopheles in Faust. Everything in existence is worth being destroyed. Everything, including the proletariat and the comrades. Marx quotes these words in the 18th Brumaire. Stalin acted on them and destroyed even his own family. Satan is called in Faust the spirit that denies everything. This is precisely Marx's attitude. He writes about pitiless criticism of all that exists. War against the situation in Germany. Merciless criticism of all. He adds, It is the first duty of the press to undermine the foundations of the existing political system. Marx said about himself that he is the most outstanding hater of the so-called positive. The Satanist sect is not materialistic. It believes in eternal life. Ulanem, the person through whom Marx speaks, does not question this. He asserts eternal life but as a life of hate magnified to its extreme. It is worth noting that eternity for devils means torment. Note Jesus' reproach by demons. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Matthew 8.29 Marx is similarly obsessed. Quote, ha! Eternity! She is our eternal grief, an indescribable and immeasurable death. Vile artificiality conceived to scorn us, ourselves being clockwork, blindly mechanical, made to be the full calendars of time and space, having no purpose save to happen, to be ruined, so that there shall be something to ruin. End quote. We begin to understand what has happened to young Marx. He had Christian convictions, but had not led a consistent life. His correspondence with his father testifies to his squandering great sums of money on pleasures, and his constant quarrelling with parental authority about this and other matters. Then he seems to have fallen in with the tenets of the highly secret Satanist church and received the rites of initiation. Satan, who his worshippers see in their hallucinatory orgies, actually speaks through them. Thus, Marx is only Satan's mouthpiece when he utters in his poem Invocation of One in Despair the words, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. Listen to the end of Ulanem. Quote, if there is a something which devours, I'll leap within it, though I bring the world to ruins. The world which bulks between me and the abyss, I will smash to pieces with my enduring curses. I'll throw my arms around its harsh reality. Embracing me, the world will dumbly pass away, and then sink down to utter nothingness, perished with no existence that would be really living. Marx was probably inspired by the words of Marcus de Sade. Quote, I abhor nature. I would like to split its planet, hinder its process, stop the circles of stars, overthrow the globes that float in space, destroy what serves nature, protect what harms it. In a word, I wish to insult it in my works. Perhaps we will be able to attack the sun, deprive the universe of it, or use it to set the world on fire. These would be real crimes. De Sade and Marx propagate the same ideas. Honest men, as well as men inspired by God, often seek to serve their fellow men by writing books to increase their store of knowledge, improve their morality, stimulate religious sentiments, or at least provide relaxation and amusement. The devil is the only being who consciously pervades only evil to humankind, and he does this through his elect servants. As far as I know, Marx is the only renowned author who has ever called his own writings shit, swinish books. He consciously, deliberately, gives his readers filth. 
No wonder then that some of his disciples, communists in Romania and Mozambique, have forced prisoners to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine. In Ulanem, Marx does what the devil does. He consigns the entire human race to damnation. Ulanem is probably the only drama in the world in which all the characters are aware of their own corruption and flaunt it and celebrate it with conviction. In this drama, there is no black and white. There exists no Claudius and Ophelia, Iago and Desdemona. Here, all are servants of darkness. All reveal aspects of Mephistopheles. All are satanic, corrupt and doomed.